So today is about uh, vision. We're going to be working our way into the cortex in this unit. And this lecture is going to take us there. We're going to go from the retina to the primary visual cortex. Uh, the processing that occurs after that we'll talk a bit more on in lecture 23 uh, when we cover the cortex. What we want to do here is figure out how we detect light in the retina and then trace out the basic pathway from retina to balance to cortex. There's a little bit of an offshoot there to hit the midbrain, brain stem. We'll cover those in the second part. The first part is really all about the retina. How do we detect light and how does that light detection then create nervous system activity? We're gonna have uh, three different layers that we'll go through. One of them detects the light, one of them kind of filters a bit, and the other one is the output. And that's what this first part is about. Uh, while we do have light sensitive retinal ganglion cells that we've covered before, the major player here are photoreceptors. And these are kind of like the hair cells in the inner ear, in that they're always active. They don't really fire action potential, but they're always spitting out glutamate. They also have ribbon synapses. The difference here is that they respond, of course, to different stimuli. They respond to light and the mechanical uh, movement of their stereocilia. They don't have it. They have light-sensitive G protein coupled receptors. And when light hits them, they're going to decrease the amount of glutamate they spit out and that is going to affect the output of the retinal ganglion cells. So here's our output. In between there, we're going to have a bipolar cell. We'll get a little lateral inhibition to clean up the image a bit. That's basically it. So where we're hanging out today is back here in the retina. Uh, we've covered a bit on how we control the pupil, how we control the lens. That's all still true. What we're concerned with now is that whenever the light hits the back of the retina, how do we pick it up? So this is all fine. We've already covered this. Light's going to come through, get focused in the lens, and then hit the back. And that's where we're at today. The retina um, is, for the most part, about 200 <coughs> microns thick. It thins out a little bit there in the fovea, and it loses these two layers here. <clears throat> we can divide the retina into three different layers. We got our outer nuclear layer, which is going to be kind of on the outside, so on the bottom. The inner nuclear layer is between the outer nuclear layer and the ganglion cell layer. So we have three layers here. One of them picks up light. So the outer nuclear layer has our photoreceptors, rods, and cones. Rods are going to pick up dim light. They won't distinguish wavelengths. Cones are going to require a little brighter light, but they'll be able to distinguish your blues from your uh, kind of yellow greens and your kind of green reds. The inner nuclear layer is between there. We have three different cell types. The main one would be the bipolar cell. Bipolar meaning they just have kind of two ends, a very simple dendritic harbor that's hooked up to the cones and rods. So they get input from photoreceptors. Their targets are going to be the retinal ganglion cells and this kind of mysterious amacrine cell. The other two cells that are in the inner nuclear layer would be the horizontal and amicum cells. Uh, these inner neurons are more involved in kind of lateral inhibition than the retina. Uh, we'll go through how horizontal cells work because we have a much better idea. Amicum cells are far more diverse. They're going to release a variety of neurotransmitters, have different targets. They're a little more complicated. <coughs> we'll talk a bit about horizontal cells. These get input from photoreceptors and feedback onto photoreceptors. They're going to spit out GABA. We'll see that how that aids in, in edge detection uh, in a little bit. That's their job. Lateral inhibition. 
help us figure out which one of these uh, photoreceptors has been exposed to light, and that will allow us to pick up edges. Because edges are fairly important. That's where stuff begins and ends. And that's really what you care about. If you want to hold an object, you need to know where it begins and ends. It doesn't really matter what's going on in the middle. I just care about the edges. I care about the edge of this table so I don't walk into it. So picking out edges is fairly important, and the horizontal cells are going to help with that. The final cell type will be our retinal ganglion cells. These are glutamatergic, and they're going to project to a variety of structures. Some of them are uh, capable of detecting light themselves. They're a very small subset. About 1% of your retinal ganglion cells are going to be sensitive to light. We've heard about these before. Those are the ones that are going to project to the, the, the midbrain, the pretectal nucleus, and, and play a role in the pupillary light response. Others will head into the suprachiasmatic nucleus, play a role in circadian rhythm entrainment. But other retinal ganglion cells that are hooked up instead to bipolar cells that are controlled by the photoreceptors, these retinal ganglion cells don't pick up the light directly. Instead, they receive this sort of linear input from the photoreceptors via bipolar cells. They're going to project mostly to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. So here's our kind of uh, primary afferents that make up the optic nerve. They're going to hit the LGN. They're going to hit the thalamus. The thalamus then projects to the visual, corte cor visual cortex. Uh, they'll make a couple of other stops as well. So they'll hit the superior colliculus of the midbrain, which we'll touch on in a bit. Um, the reticular formation, we kind of stimulate arousal uh, in response to light. So they got a few different targets. Here's your major one. And as far as your, your creation of visual perceptions goes, that's the one. So we first hit the LGN and the thalamus, then it goes to the cortex, and that's where the magic happens. <coughs> So you might have noticed that the arrangement here is a little flipped. Our outer nuclear layer is in the back. Those other layers are stacked on top of it, so your retinal ganglion cells are actually sitting on top of your photoreceptors. So the, the light that comes through our eye has to first pass through those other two layers, so your retinal ganglion cells your amacrine, bipolar, horizontal cells, and then it hits the photoreceptors. Because of this arrangement, that optic nerve that we create has to find a way of piercing through the retina. So those axons from retinal ganglion cells are running on the surface, and they're going to emerge at the optic disc, create the optic nerve. And at that point, you, of course, have a blind spot. Since we're putting all of our axons and blood vessels through the retina there, we can't put photoreceptors there. And without photoreceptors, you don't pick up light. You don't pick up light, you don't see. So each of our eyes is going to have a blind spot, a little off-center. And that's just because of the arrangement of our retina. You've got to get blood in there to keep everything alive, so you've got to have a hole somewhere. And we're going to put that in with our optic nerve. Our optic nerve has to pierce the retina because our retinal ganglion cells are on the surface rather than buried. That's where you put our photoreceptors. The photoreceptors are the cells that are going to pick up light. They're going to transduce brightness or dimness into a change in electrical activity, and thus a change in neurotransmitter release. That's what it's all about. We turn light into electricity and, ele and electricity into chemical. And then we're off to the races. Then it's just your basic pattern of electrical, chemical signaling, going from retina to thalamus to cortex. <clears throat> the way that they pick this up is using really the same photopigment. They're all going to use retinol here. And it's coupled to different opsins. The opsin is your G protein coupled receptor. So they're partners here. The retinol is the pigmented molecule that's going to absorb light. Anything that has a color absorbs light. So the retinol is colored, 
it's going to absorb light, and really it's going to absorb kind of this wavelength down here, kind of your ultraviolets. But by linking it up to different opsins, that's going to shift the wavelength that it detects. So even though you have the same photo pigment, it gets a slightly different color because of the different opsin proteins and how they interact with it. So here's what's different. So we have three different opsins that we can express in our cones. L, M, and S, long, medium, short. We're talking about is the wavelength that they're going to absorb as a result. S opsins, shorter wavelengths. So we're going to hit more of our blues <coughs> in this case. In the perfect cartoon world, we think of these as absorbing blue light and nothing else. Of course, that's not true. They're going to absorb a variety of wavelengths. But they're more sensitive to blue. So think of them as that. M, we tend to think of as green. You see it right there in the cartoon. So in the perfect cartoon world, they absorb green, nothing else. Of course, that's not true. Here's your broad set of wavelengths that M opsins pick up. Notice we got some blues. We got some greens, we got some yellows, we got a little red, not a whole lot. The reds are going to be handled more by the L opsins. They pick up those longer wavelengths. Considerable overlap between these two. So we're going to have to distinguish between those. Of course, we have a way of doing that, and we'll get to that later. But if you're going to pick up green versus red and tell those colors apart, so you behave appropriately at your traffic lights, you're going to need to distinguish whether we have more activity in our M or L options. If M is more active, well, we're probably down here in more of our greens. And if the Ls are more active, well, we're probably a little right shifted here, a bit more red. And it's okay to think of them as blue, green, and red. That's fine. That'll make everything work out perfectly. And we'll have a way of turning them into that later on. But right there in the retina, they're really not that specific. Color detection is very gross and broad in the retina. We don't actually build distinct hues until a couple steps later in the cortex. We just make broad distinctions here. We do not make those broad distinctions with our rods. Same, same system here, but they only have one type of opsin that they express. Because they don't have different opsins, they're not going to distinguish different wavelengths. They just pick up light. Rhodopsin here is a kind of a broad spectrum. It's going to hit a variety of wavelengths. And because of how we couple our rods to the retinal ganglion cells, they're going to be able to detect, to detect very dim levels of light. So I want you to think of cones as needing bright light, but they'll give you color. They give you color because of the different options. Rods are going to pick up dim light. They don't distinguish color. That's their general distinction. Luckily, the signaling is all the same under the hood. It doesn't matter what wavelength you're picking up. It's going to be the same G protein, the same mechanism of hyperpolarization. Unfortunately, it's not GS, GI, or GQ. So here's, here's a new G protein. It's kind of like GI. We're going to have a decrease in the cyclic nucleotides, but we, we have a different mechanism of doing that. Rather than turning off the synthetic enzyme, we're going to turn on the destructive enzyme. The G protein here is called transducin. So here's your receptor. We got a G protein coupled receptor that'd be the opsin bound to the photopigment, that's your retinol. So the retinol absorbs light. When it does that, it changes the, the shape of our opsin a little bit, and that causes it to stick a GTP onto transducin. When we do that, it does what any G protein does. It dissociates from the beta gamma complex and swims around and does something. That something that it does is stimulate a phosphodiesterase, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's an enzyme, A's, that's going to break phosphodiester bonds. That's what's making our cyclic nucleotide cyclic. The nucleotide we're after in this case is cyclic GMP. We're going to turn that into just regular old GMP. That's what our phosphodiesterase catalyzes. It's kind of like what happens whenever you inhibit adenyl cyclase, or I guess in this case quantyl cyclase you get a decrease in cyclic nucleotide concentration. But it's a slightly different way of doing it. This is a little more direct. 
we simulate phosphodiesterase, and that directly destroys our cyclic nucleotides and makes them non-cyclic. When they're non-cyclic, they don't stimulate cyclic nucleotide gated cation channels. We've seen this before. That's all to say. All it is is a slightly different enzyme. Rather than inhibiting the enzyme that makes it, we activate an enzyme that destroys. That decreases cyclic nucleotide levels. That cation conductance drops, and we hyperpolarize. So light is going to turn off your photoreceptors. And of course, that makes everything downstream a little more complicated, because now you've got to reverse everything. We're not spitting out more glutamate, we're spitting out less glutamate. So that makes the on and the off a, a little tricky. But if you remember that light hyperpolarizes your, uh, your photoreceptors, that's going to remind you just flip everything. Like the, inner, like the hair cells in our inner ear, our photoreceptors are always active. Especially if you close your eyes. Not a lot of light comes in. Nothing to hyperpolarize. So they have a fairly high rate of neurotransmitter release. Of course, if you're going to have a high rate of neurotransmitter release, you've got to increase the size of your readily releasable pool. They solve this problem the exact same way that hair cells do. Ribbon synapses. Use a couple of ribbon synapses on a photoreceptor. Invaginate some membrane, increase the surface area for your readily releasable pool, and now you have a greater number of vesicles that you can release. So our photoreceptors can constantly release glutamate until light hits them. When light hits them, there's a decrease in the amount of glutamate <coughs> release. No action potentials. It's not all or none. It's a graded change. The brighter the light, the greater the hyperpolarization, the greater the decrease glutamate release. So this allows the retina to give us an idea of just how bright the light is. The brighter it is, the more they hyperpolarize, and the less glutamate they spit out, the less they're going to affect bipolar cells and retinal ganglion cells. Now our rods and our cones are distributed throughout the retina, but not uniformly. The center of our visual field is a spot in the retina called the fovea. The fovea is where you find pretty much all your cones. The overwhelming majority of your cones are going to be found right there in the fovea. So if you were to go through and count the abundance of rods and cones as a function of angle away from the center of your visual field, so zero is Right smack dab in the middle, that's your fovea. You'll notice that's where all the cones are. That'd be the filled bars here. Pretty much devoid of rods. You find rods more in the periphery. So as you move away from the center of your visual field, you see an increase in rods. Of course, until you hit the blind spot. We can't put any photoreceptors there. So right there in the center, of your retina, the center of your visual field. That's where we have our cones. That's where we're going to be able to best distinguish color, see fine details, because there's going to be a one-to-one -one coupling of photoreceptors to retinal ganglion cells. So they're going to have very small receptive fields. <coughs> if you want to see something clearly, just look right at it, as long as you have enough light. Um, have you all ever gone out and looked at the stars? I so. Um, a little harder to do in the big city. Um, uh, but if you get out there in the country, you know, it's a little darker. You can, you can see the stars well. You ever try to see a really dim star? You look right at it and it disappears. You look a little away and oh, it's, it's back twinkling. If not, you haven't looked at the stars enough. Get out there, enjoy life. <laughs> the reason that that occurs is because of where we put our rods, the ones that pick up the dim light. They're not right there in the fovea. The fovea is really nice. It gives us excellent detail. And if you want to read, you look at, I can read that's from McDonald's. I looked right ahead. 
if I'm looking right here, I can't really tell what that says. I can't tell. I mean, I remember, of course. But I don't look away from stuff I want to read. I look right at it, and that's because that's where I've jam-packed my cones. I can see stuff as long as the lights are on. But when it gets dim, then the periphery is going to play a more important role. That's where we put our rods. There's also going to be greater convergence. We don't have that one-to-one -one mapping. We only have that one-to-one -one mapping right there in the fovea. Um, you all have smartphones, yes? They have cameras on them. You ever take a, a, a picture and it's a little dark? We have so much in common. We look at stars, we take pictures of things. Well, when it's dark, how's the resolution of the image? It's a little grainy. Yeah, right? It's not as crisp. Blurry, sure. Well, that's because the, the camera does what our eyes do. It bends. It puts multiple pixels together. So if you take your, your uh, photo array there that's picking up the light, essentially the retina of your camera, instead of letting each of these detectors give you an individual image, it'll just put them all together. We don't have enough light to make an image. So all the light that hits here, 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 we're going to just sum it together. What that does is increase your brightness ninefold. But what you're losing is resolution. You just don't see as well. It gets a little, I guess, blurry or grainy, however you want to think of it. Because we can't distinguish the light that hit here from here. We've summed it together. So your picture's a little blurrier, but at least you can see something in it. You have some contrast. That's what's going on in our periphery out here. It's not one-to-one -one coupling like we would get in bright light. Now we're going to take all nine of these, or in our case 15 to 30, and we're going to count them as one giant pixel. So we take multiple photoreceptors out in the periphery, multiple rods, and converge them onto a single retinal ganglion cell. So all of the light, all the very dim light that's hitting those 15 to 30 photoreceptors gets summed together on that one retinal ganglion cell. So you don't have as good a resolution. You can't read by looking away, but you can pick out things like the little twinkle of a star. That's because of our high-tech retinas. We bend our pixels out there in the periphery. All we have in the fovea is cones. It's just a dense collection of cones. And these cones are a little bit smaller. In order to get the, the highest visual acuity, we have to decrease the size of our cones so they can separate light that's hitting here from here, from here, from here. The larger your cell, the larger its receptive field, and the less it can tell two photons apart. So we increase the resolution but at the same time, we're, by sampling a smaller area, we're going to need brighter light. And that's why colors are, are, are going to only be vibrant when you have plenty of light to see them. As it gets darker, the colors aren't quite as bright anymore. They all get a little gray and, and dim. The fovea kind of has a little dip because we push aside the other layers to allow maximum light exposure because we have those very small cones collected in the fovea. They're smaller than the cones just outside the fovea. And as such, we gotta push these cells out of the way. They're gonna, they're gonna absorb or, or refract the light. They're gonna interfere with these little tiny cones from getting the light that they need to pick up. So there's a couple different things that we're doing in our fovea. We're pushing aside our internuclear layer and our, and our ganglion cell layer there, so just our cones exposed to light and we shrink the size of our cones so we can pack more of them in there and that one-to-one -one coupling make sure that we have the greatest visual acuity possible so if you want to look at something look at it you can quote me on that the bipolar cells downstream of our photoreceptors come in two types as well 
So we got our rods and our cones. The bipolar cells have to be on or off. That tells you exactly how they respond to light, pretty much. When light hits a photoreceptor, it hyperpolarizes, spits out less glutamate. So if we're going to turn on a cell by spitting out less glutamate, that means that that glutamate had to inhibit that cell. If we're going to turn off a cell in response to less glutamate, that means the glutamate must have been stimulating that cell. Remember I said that the fact that we're spitting out less glutamate is going to make things a little more complicated. It's not that bad when you think about it for a you know, dozen years. So off bipolar cells, <coughs> these are pretty straightforward amphoreceptors. Those glutamate receptors that allow for fast depolarization. That's what they have. So when it's dark, photoreceptors are spitting out glutamate tonically. They're stimulating amber receptors. They're still cation channels and they're depolarizing the off bipolar cell. When light hits and we spit out less glutamate, there's less activation of our amber receptors, less depolarization, and that's why they are turned off. So the off bipolar cells are turned off by light and thus turned on by glutamate. Flip all that for our on bipolar cells. They are turned on by light because they are turned off by glutamate. And when light hits the photoreceptor, it spits out less glutamate, so we're not turning it off as much. What glutamate's doing here is, of course, acting on metabotropic glutamate receptors. This is a large uh, family of proteins. You got at least eight different types. And there's probably a couple different types in our on bipolar cells. Um, there's probably MBUARs that are coupled to uh, your, your transducin and stimulating the phosphodiesterase. That's probably still true here. Um, it's probably also true that you have your GI coupled MBUR6s. Either way, what you get is a decrease in cyclic nucleotides, a decrease in cyclic nucleotide gated cation channel conductance, and thus hyperpolarization. But that's with glutamate. What we're talking about is without glutamate. So we've got to flip that. The on bipolar cells are going to get turned on because we're not spitting out glutamate and causing hyperpolarization. By removing that inhibition, they get excited. So you just got to flip these. The bipolar cells are then going to communicate to retinal ganglion cells. Those are going to create your optic nerve. Head on back into the thalamus. That will go to the cortex and we'll see something. So the bipolar cell translates activity in the photoreceptor to activity in the retinal ganglion cell. You got to go through these first. Photoreceptors aren't directly coupled to retinal ganglion cells. They're going to be coupled to off or on bipolar <coughs> cells. And this is going to be incredibly important for our color distinction. How do we tell if it's more M or more L? We have to have different responses to those two. And the bipolar cells allow us to have both excitation and inhibition of the retinal ganglion cells in response to light. So we can now do some comparisons. How much M, how much L? For rods, it's just going to be on. That's it. Rods are pretty straightforward. If light hits the photoreceptor, it hyperpolarizes. That stimulates the on bipolar cell. That stimulates the retinal ganglion cell. For cones, because we're trying to distinguish colors, a little different. We've got to have this off bipolar cell there. And we'll see why around the end. It really has to do with that overlap between our, our different options, M and L. I mean, their peaks are pretty much the same, just a bit of a shift. So we've got to find a way of teasing that out. We're going to take advantage of this to do that. The horizontal cells. So the other cell type I want to talk about in the internuclear layer. These are going to inhibit our photoreceptors. So these, these get input from photoreceptors. When photoreceptors spit out glutamate, it stimulates horizontal cells. And horizontal cells then feed back onto multiple photoreceptors and provide GABAergic inhibition. So what this lateral inhibition does is help us with edge detection. 
So whenever light hits a photoreceptor, that's going to decrease the amount of glutamate it spits out. So the horizontal cells near it are going to be less excited. They'll be spitting out a little less GABA as opposed to the horizontal cells away from there that aren't getting exposed to light. They'll still be stimulated and spitting out GABA. And what this will do is create greater contrast at edges. So you can think of this as light or the presence of darkness. It doesn't really matter. We'll draw this out again if you need to. Here's our photoreceptor. Okay, this is your photoreceptors here. Some of them are going to be more active if they're, let's say, in the dark. And those in the light, they're a little less active. They're hyperpolarized. So the activity of the horizontal cells here is going to be a bit different. Those are going to be a lot more active where it's dark and less active where it's light. There's been now less glutamate, remember? So like glutamate's not stimulating the horizontal cells as much. Now they're feeding back onto neighbors. And this lateral inhibition is what's going to cause this change down here. So the actual output, sure it's different in your areas where you have the darkness and the light, but right there at the edge, you get greater contrast because of different activation of your horizontal cells. Right there at the edge, some of the horizontal cells will be a little less active because of the light, and that neighbor over there will be a little more active. So the amount of inhibition is a little more in between what we have over there in the darkness and over there in the light. And we can walk through this stepwise if you need to. But what it does is help us detect our edges. They pop a little bit more because we have a greater contrast here at the edge than we do in the middle of our object where there's light, where there's dark. So it allows us to better pick out edges and see where things begin and end. The retinal ganglion cells within the fovea are going to have just one-to-one -one coupling with photoreceptors. But outside the fovea, there's going to be some convergence. And that allows them to have receptive fields that exhibit this center surround organization. Not so much in the center, but in the periphery where we're converging multiple photoreceptors and bipolar cells onto our retinal ganglion cells, that allows them to respond a little differently to light depending on whether there's on or off bipolar cells between the photoreceptor and the retinal ganglion cell. And what you tend to see is that there's usually an on <coughs> surrounded by offs. So that light that hits the photoreceptor directly in the middle of its receptive field, that's going to depolarize the retinal ganglion cell. But outside of that center, you get the opposite effect. There are also, of course, off-center, where when light hits the center, it hyperpolarizes, and when light hits the periphery, it depolarizes. In this case, you must have an off-bipolar cell right there, surrounded by on-bipolar cells. In this case, on-bipolar cell, surrounded by off. So depending on which photoreceptors you hit, in which bipolar cells you go through, the retinal ganglion cell is going to respond differently. This is going to help a lot with color detection. You're only really going to see it outside the fovea, where you have that lack of one-to-one -one coupling. You have to have convergence for this to take place. In the fovea, no surround. It's only center. So they're either on or off because there's that one-to-one -one coupling. Here you can see that in action. Go ahead and look somewhere on there. You see the little areas of darkness where our lights converge right there. So if you look here, all the other points of convergence, all the other intersections are going to have a little bit of darkness there. And this is because of center surround organization of retinal ganglion cells. Your retinal ganglion cells outside the fovea, right where you're looking, we don't have that. So you're not going to see this illusion. It's only the other intersections outside of directly where you're looking where we have convergence that this illusion emerges. And the reason for that has to do with the receptive fields. 
So those retinal ganglion cells that are picking up right there in the intersection, their periphery is going to be exposed to more light than those right here on the, just the straights between your boxes, not the intersections. So that center surround inhibition is going to cause the retinal ganglion cells here to be a little more inhibited than those looking right there. Notice the amount of surround that's going to be stimulated by light. A lot more there. And that creates the illusion that it's a little dimmer. Of course it's not. You look at it, it's the same. But that center surround creates that illusion. That's not the purpose of it, of course. But you can just see that this occurs in your own eyes and heads. The purpose of it has to do with comparing really different wavelengths of light. That's what this is going to come down to. But it's going to come down to that in the next point. Do we have any questions before we move on to there? Okay, then let's review these. Then let's talk about the projections of the retinal ganglion cells. <coughs> The retinal ganglion cells, some of them are going to be color responsive uh, if they're hooked up to a cone, others just responsive to light. Uh, these are going to project through the retina, creating the optic nerve. This will converge to the optic chiasm, we get our optic tracts, and then we're going to hit a couple different targets. The main one is the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. So this nucleus is connected to the primary visual cortex, and thus the neurons that project there are ultimately going to affect the activity back in our occipital lobes and help us create conscious perception of vision. Now the, the way that we send visual information back to the cortex depends on which side of the world it's coming from, not so much which eye. Both eyes are going to hit both sides of the cortex back here. Different visual fields are going to hit different sides of the cortex, though. So the left visual field is going to, of course, hit the right side of the retina in each eye. The right visual field is going to be sent over to the left side of the retina. So everything on the left Everything on the left of what we're seeing with both of our eyes is going to be projected contralaterally over to the right lateral geniculate nucleus and the right primary visual cortex. Everything on the right side of our visual field hits the left side of our retina and heads over to the left lateral geniculate nucleus and left primary visual cortex. So it's contralateral, just like most things in the cortex, like motor control, somatic sensation, but it's not contralateral for the eye that in mind. It's contralateral for your visual field. So some axons are going to stay on the right side from the right eye. Others are going to cross over and hit the left side. <coughs> Depends on what part of the world they're picking up. That first little bit here is your optic nerve. So going from the retina on back, your two optic nerves meet up at the optic chiasm. From here, there's a little bit of an offshoot to hit the hypothalamus right here. So those neurons that are involved with your circadian rhythm entrainment, they make a bit of a pit stop right here and hit your suprachiasmatic nucleus. Most of the others are going to continue along the optic tracts there. Then there's going to be another division. The major uh, lateral route there is going to head into the lateral geniculate nucleus. That's what we're seeing here. This is going to be involved in uh, visual perception. There's a more medial offshoot of this optic tract that's going to hit more midbrain structures. Superior colliculus, the tectal nucleus, the superior colliculus is going to be um, involved with detecting eye movements. The pretectal nucleus is going to be more involved with the parasympathetic input back to the iris. We have the pupillary light response there. The reticular formation, these neurons are going to be involved with stimulating cortical arousal, so when it's bright, it'll keep us a bit awake. That lateral route is just going to head into the lateral geniculate nucleus, and then it's going to project back into the primary visual cortex. 
there's an organization in our lateral geniculate nucleus, not surprisingly, we're going to see that this organization is carried forward in the primary visual cortex. So there's a, a, a retinotopic map, so neurons that are near one another in the retina, target neurons that are near one another in the LGN, those target neurons that are near one another in the primary visual cortex. There's also an organization based on what type of retinal ganglion cell is projecting to the LGN. Some retinal ganglion cells are going to be color responsive if they're hooked up to a cone, others not so much if they're hooked up to a rod. They're going to detect different types of information, they'll have different firing properties, and they'll hit different layers of your lateral geniculate nucleus. So we can see here fairly distinct layers of cells. Uh, they're just doing a cell stain here, so everything that's dark is a little cell. Some of those cells aren't so little, so these first one, two layers here are going to be your magnocellular layers, big cells, in other words. Magnocellular neurons, these aren't going to be uh, color responsive so much. They're going to get input more from uh, retinal ganglion cells that are innervated by rods. Those retinal ganglion cells that project there, they're called M cells because they have the magnocellular layer. We'll see this is flipped, unfortunately, with another name and scheme. But anyway, these M cells are going to project to the first two layers because they get input from the rods there. And because they desensitize rapidly, conduct action potentials rapidly, we think of them as being a lot more important for detecting movement, just things moving. Not so much in distinguishing um, objects and colors. That's going to be more down in these other cell types. So we have the P cells, which project to the parvocellular layer, uh, layers 3, 4, 5, and 6. These have much smaller receptive fields because they're hooked up to cones, especially those in the fovea, very small receptive fields in that case. So we have better visual acuity because they're hooked up to cones. They're also going to play a role in distinguishing colors. The P cells are going to handle more red-green distinctions, while the blue-yellow distinction is going to be down here with our K cells. They project to the coniocellular layers, which they haven't labeled here. They're those white bands between our layers. Coniocellular just means dust cell. They're very, very small. And as such, these are less well characterized uh, than the others. <coughs> So the projections to the coniocellular layer are a little uh, newer in our textbooks than those to the magno and parvocellular layers. Magnocellular means big, parvocellular means little, coniocellular means dust. So the magnocellulars are the largest, the coniocellulars are the smallest. But size isn't everything, it's more about what they do. Color distinction with our parvocellular layers, the coniocellular layers, red-green, Blue, yellow. One distinction for your K cells is that they don't have that center surround. <coughs> they're all center. And they're either on or they're off. And they're going to be on with blue, off with yellow. <coughs> Unfortunately, there's another name for these cells. And one begins with an M, one begins with a P, and wouldn't you know it, they're flipped. Isn't that great? So your midget cells, which are going to be the retinal ganglion cells, that are very small. Starts with an M, that's not the M cell. That's your T cell. And the K cells, too. Your M cells are going to be the parasol cells. Starts with a P. It's not the P cell, though. They have much larger receptive fields because they have larger dendritic arbors. Just have a look. Those midget cells have very small dendrites. They cover a very small area with their dendrites, thus they have a small receptive field. Only input right here is going to affect this midget cell. Input anywhere from here to here is going to stimulate this parasol cell. <coughs> That allows different retinal ganglion cells to be sensitive to dim or brighter light. 
to have better visual acuity or poorer visual acuity. It really just has to do with their dendrites and the types of photoreceptors that they're hooked up with. So these M and P cells project to different areas of the lateral genitalia the nucleus. Those are then going to project backward into our primary visual cortex, right there in the medial portions of our occipital lobes. If you were to peel these back, you'd see the calcar and sulcus running there, and about five millimeters above and below that groove is where we have our primary visual cortex. Primary meaning this is the first place where we start to tease apart what it is we're looking at. Within the primary visual cortex, there are what we call ocular dominance columns. So columns of cells running through all the layers of the cortex, more on this in lecture 23, but all of the cells in that entire column from layers uh, two on down are going to respond to input from a single eye, either the left or the right. Of course, if we're on the right side, we're still dealing with just the left visual field, but remember, we're getting input from both eyes there. And we keep them separate. This will allow us to detect disparity between our two eyes, give us a sense of depth, things like that. But we keep them separated in our primary visual cortex. Because what we're concerned with is very fine detail. <clears throat> we keep our eyes separate and we try to recreate our retina by preserving the spatial relationship between our retinal ganglion cells here and the neurons they respond to here. So that retinal ganglion cells near one another in the retina are going to target neurons near one another in the primary visual cortex. Kind of like the body maps we have for somatosensation and motor function, here it's for vision. So this allows our cortex to have a picture of the retina. If two neurons are active next to one another in the primary visual cortex, that means that two neurons near one another in the retina were active. We're going to pick out very fine detail here. Oh, here's our retinal top map. So, what we're looking at is the medial portion of the left and right occipital lobe. So, if you were to open up my skull and peel the occipital lobes open, that's what you'd see. Here's your calcarine fissure here. This is just showing you a color coded and number coded retina projected onto the primary visual cortex. So your fovea, one, two, three, four there, one and two, hitting the left visual field, of course hitting the right primary visual cortex, those on the right hit the left. You'll notice three is above four, here it's of course flipped, just like our sides get flipped, we're flipping up and down here. Uh, three is next to seven, it is here too. Seven's near eight. So we're mapping our retina on the primary visual cortex. What we're picking up here in the primary visual cortex is very fine detail. Do I have lines? Do I have a, a bend? There are neurons that are only responsive if there's a bend. And if there's no bend, they don't respond. There are other neurons uh, that are going to detect only this angle, not this angle and others will detect this angle, not this angle. Very fine detail. You ever heard the expression that you can't see the forest for the trees? All right, we're not even looking at trees yet. We're looking at little pieces of bark. Incredibly fine detail here. What we're gonna do is build that stepwise, and we'll, we'll hit this a bit in lecture 23, but you take your lines, you put them together, hell, the next thing you know, you got a shape. You put your shapes together, you, you got an object. Oh, I'm looking. Okay, I got lines. Let's see. I got some. I got some lines like this, and I got some of those, and I got those. And the way that they're arranged, well, turns out it's making me an, an octagon. And well, wouldn't you know? It's it's red. Of course, this is blue, but you no, know, it's a red octagon. And there's some, like some curvy stuff in here. And we build it later on if we're looking at a stop sign. Our retina has no idea. Our primary visual cortex has no idea. Our secondary visual cortex has no idea. It's not until several steps later that we finally figure out what it is. 
Things that are a little more complicated and a little more important to us, like faces, they're going to have their own area. There are face responsive neurons that will tell you that's a face. Even if it's not, maybe it's a bowl of fruit, it kind of looks like a face. You'll kind of get that impression. Oh, yeah, I see it. You know, you get the banana for the mouth and some. I don't know, strawberries or whatever it ends up being, or you look at the front of a car, oh, there's the headlights and the grill, yeah, sure, I get you. Face responsive neurons, when these get damaged, you don't see faces anymore. It's terrible. But we're not going to build that until much later, outside our visual cortex, in fact, down there in the temporal lobes. What we're going to find out is that we're going to send two different pathways out. What am I looking at? Let's ask the temporal lobes. I can't figure it out. I'm looking at little pieces of bark. I'm looking at the fine details. Hell, I don't even know color yet. All I know is lines. Lines, edges, and angles. I'll put all that stuff together later on. Color we're going to build here. We'll build shapes as well. I'll figure out where it is by heading up to the parietal lobes. We'll find out. Because just because an object is up in my visual field doesn't mean it's actually above me. And I can tell that. I know you're not impressed. You should be. Uh, that's because the projection's on up here to my parietal lobe. I have an idea of where objects are relative to one another. Even though when I move my head around and you all are moving in my visual field, I don't get the sense that you're moving. I know where you are. But I build that later. For the primary visual cortex, it's very granular detail. And we're going to build it stepwise. And this is what we do everywhere in the cortex. The primary cortices are always very granular details. What's the direction of motion? Forward, back, left, right. We have neurons that only respond to those. Same thing is true for vision. We have neurons that respond to very specific angles, ends of lines. If a neuron sees this in its receptive field, it might respond differently than if it sees this. There are some neurons that are only going to be active if it stops. You've got to have the end of a line in its visual field. That's what it cares about. And by converging these neurons together, because they're retinotopically mapped, we can tell if we have a certain set of lines next to one another and a certain orientation, we can tell that we're looking at shapes. We'll put together color as well by converging information from different neurons that are color responsive. So how do we tell green from red? We got all that overlap in our opsins. What we have to do is compare the relative degree of activity of M and L. The way that we do that is, of course, with on and off bipolar cells. Some cells are going to get turned on by our M optin expressing cones, and others are going to get turned off. Same thing is true for L. So you can have specific red neurons they have the L opsin cone with an on bipolar cell going into them, and they have the M opsin cone with an off bipolar cell converging onto them. So if it's stimulating the M more than the L, you get net inhibition. If it's stimulating the L more than the M, in other words, if it's red, you get net excitation. And if it's yellow, nothing. No net change. It's just as red as it is green. Yellow is red and green. For green, same M and L, but now we have on for M, off for L. Now they only respond to green. This is very crude in the retina. We don't really see color. We can pretty well distinguish blues from the rest of the stuff, but that fine distinction of hue, that's not going to take place until several steps later in the secondary visual cortex. Because most of your retinal ganglion cells are not going to be color opponent cells. Your lateral geniculate nucleus will have color opponent cells where they're going to compare L cone versus M cone or S cone versus the others. So that calculation is going to be done more in your thalamus. That will help to distinguish broadly. Is it more green than red? Is it more blue than yellow? Is it more white than black? Those are the broad distinctions that we build there, but that's of course not a color. There are colors that are neither green, yellow, blue, or red. They're somewhere in between. We're going to build that later on. So these color opponent cells are going to hit slightly more complicated color opponent cells in the primary visual cortex. And somewhere in the secondary visual cortex, the magic 
a hue emerges. Is it green? Is it chartreuse? How chartreuse is it? <laughs> Our secondary visual cortex is going to figure that out. And it's by comparing this granular information to one another. If you have more green responsive neurons active than red, it's more green than it is red. And here's your color opponent process summarized in a, in, a, in a graphic here. So we have three different types of options, and using only these three, we can detect all the different colors. So that first step, how do we detect, let's say, red from green? The pointy arrow means you have the on bipolar cell. The blunt means you have off. So if our L cones have an on, and our M cones have an off, only the reddest of wavelengths will excite you. Anything that's a little more green is going to inhibit you. The green ones are going to have on for our M cones and off for L. So only the greener wavelengths are going to excite you. Anything red, that's going to be inhibition. Blue-yellow is the other set of color opponent cells. Here they're going to be comparing S cones to the other two. If you have an on for S and off for the others, you only respond to those shorter blue wavelengths. Anything that's beyond that is going to cause inhibition. As the greens and reds start to peak in, they will inhibit you. Now, there's not a lot of green and red on this. And we don't see it as green and red. We see it as blue. Anything that's yellow, well, if you're stimulating M and L, that's great, but white light could do that too. So if we want to distinguish yellow from white light, we have to have a little inhibition here from our S cones. So you put an off bipolar cell between S and this color opponent cell. So here's your first step in distinguishing colors. We take three different cones and now turn it into four different colors and an amount of brightness by putting on between all of these. Your rods will help there too. By doing this, then we compare these guys. All right, how bright is it? That's going to help me determine how, how uh, saturated the color is, for example. Well, let's compare just how much activity is here, because it's not all or none. There's going to be a frequency of activity. You'll see an increase in frequency as it gets more red, but it's not night and day. There's going to be a, a, a kind of smooth gradations of their frequency of activity. The redder it is, the more active these are. The more active these will be, the less active these will be. These will be. And so we'll build distinct hues that way. But it's by taking your simple bits of information and then building them together to make it a little more complex. Do we have any questions? Yeah. So that picture all that you explained is what's going on when it's in the lateral geniculum. Yeah, exactly. This is the computation taking place in your LGN. A little bit in the retina, but that's uh, a minority of the retinal ganglion cells. Most have that one-to-one -one coupling. Here's your LGN. Then these color opponent cells in the LGN project to other color opponent cells in the primary visual cortex. Then they compare their notes. And those neurons project to now very uh, specific hue sensitive neurons. And that's where the final decision is made. Anything else? Well, then let's wrap it up.